Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And a very warm welcome to each and every one of you here in the church and at home. And if you're going to listen to this, watch us later on. The best of luck. <laughs> Let us worship Almighty God. We sing in 441. Blessing and honor and glory and power. Let us pray. Blessing and honour and glory and power, our words echo the praise of heaven as you, Jesus Christ, rise above the limitations of earth to sit forever on the right hand side of God. Though now we cannot ascend to where you are, still raise our hopes and hearts that our discipleship in this world may be touched with the glory of heaven and our lives be signs and promises of the fullness of the life to come. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, and give us the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
I don't think it will stay here, so here we are. Boys and girls, I've got something in this jar. It's, I won't bring it any closer because nuts can harm some people. Can you see what it is? Well, I've said it, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> right. Does anybody know what kind of nut it is? It's a hazelnut, yes. It's a hazelnut. Let me tell you about this hazelnut. Many years ago, many hundreds of years ago, there lived a woman in a town in England called Norwich, whose name was Mother Julian. Mother Julian didn't want to spend her life making breakfasts for people or going for the messages or taking a run round the park. Mother Julian wanted to spend all her time thinking about God and talking to God. So she went to live in a church. One day, she had an idea. God made the world. God must have loved the world. God must love everything in the world, even something as tiny as a little hazelnut. And if God loves a tiny hazelnut, he must surely love you and me. Now, last time I was talking to you, you sang a wonderful song called Alleluia. And today I'm going to invite you to sing another song, a song about a hazelnut. Let's try the chorus first, and I know all our friends and the other pews are going to join in and help us. The chorus goes, God made it, God loves it, and God will always care. Listen again. God made it, God loves it, and God will always care. And the next line is almost the same. God made it, God loves it, and God will ever care for it. I tell you what, say you. God, God will ever care for you. That's the second verse. Alison, do, would you like to put in the, just for that chorus. Mm. Ready? And. God made it, God loves it, and God will always care. God made it, God loves it, and God will ever care for you. Now here's the rest of the tune. It goes like this. A small thing like a hazelnut lay in my open hand. And the second line is almost the same. And it goes like this. And God disclosed three truths to me that I might understand. And then it goes into the chorus. Let's just do it. All right, Alison. Okay. Just give us the chord again. Starting at the beginning, and the boys and girls be ready to come in with your chorus. Okay? And. A small thing like a hazelnut lies in my open hand. And God disclosed three truths to me that I might understand. God made it, God loves it, and God will always care. God made it, God loves it, and God will always care for it. Second verse. 
I marvel that this little thing reveals what God can be. Our maker, lover, keeper, love, and all eternity. God made it, God loves you, and God will always care. God made you, God loves you, and God will ever care for you. Until my heart As you go to Sunday school, we pray that we will remember God's loving the hazelnut and God loving us. Amen. <coughs> Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, risen and ascended, the Word made flesh before all and in all and beyond all, for the lives you have given us and the gift of eternal life. And so we praise you. For the beauty and the complexity, the variety and wonder of life that surrounds us, for the opportunities and the challenges and the experiences and the achievements that life offers us. For the things we think we can do, see and touch, hear and feel, smell and taste, we praise you. Lord Jesus, Lamb of God, Heavenly King, for your love that surrounds us and the inner presence of the Holy Spirit, we praise you. Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us that we have not lived our lives to the full. We have taken its wonder for granted. We have failed to appreciate its potential. We have lost sight of the abundant eternal life that you offer. And so for offering us life despite all that, we praise you. Forgive us. Forgive us that we have not responded to the love shown to us. We have allowed, allowed it to, to be poisoned through discord and division. We have starved it of all nourishment through failing to offer our love in return. We have closed our hearts to all you would have offered us. Forgive us that we have not begun to grasp your Lordship. We have not kept our sense of awe and wonder before you. We have let our vision become stilted and we have offered worship that is half-hearted, reflecting our weakness rather than reflecting your great glory. For calling us, despite all that, we praise you. <coughs> Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord, open our hearts as we worship you today to the fullness of life. 
the fullness of your love and a fuller understanding of your greatness. And so we may truly confess you as King of kings and Lord of lords. For all you are, all you have done, and all you have yet to do, we praise you this day and forever. When we recognize our sins and confess them to Almighty God, we know that God forgives us so that we can be sure that our sins are no more and that we can start afresh on a clean page. And for that, we praise Almighty God. Amen. Now hear the word of God. Our first reading is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 49, beginning at verse 14. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these might forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands, your walls are continually before me. Your builders outdo your destroyers, and those who laid you waste go away from you. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather. They come to you. As I live, says the Lord, you shall put all of them on like an ornament, and like the bride, you shall bind them on. We continue with a, a hymn, hymn uh, number 57, The Lord Doth Reign.
continue with a second reading from the book of Acts, chapter 1. And instead of what's written, we are starting from verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Aphius, and Simon the Zealot and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we begin the sermon, I want to say a very warm word of thanks to Susie and Paul. Um, it was while we were talking in the vestry beforehand and uh, Paul was telling a story about um, a, 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 a sweetmeat company who kept peanut bars uh, separately packed in uh, boxes uh, for safety because of allergies. And when people come to get them, they got them in that form. And then it was, we realized that hazelnuts were nuts <laughs> and that uh, there could be people with allergies and we found on inquiry that there were people for whom this would be a risk. So that's why it was in a wee jar. <laughs> Four words from our second reading. Together with certain women. The disciples have got back to Jerusalem after their last ever meeting with Jesus and Luke, the author of the book of Acts, lists some names and then he recounts all these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women. Not just a bunch of women in the background, but certain women, specific women including Mary, the mother of Jesus. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. We speak of 12 disciples, but 12 is a symbolic number in the Bible. 12 tribes of Israel, 12 baskets of food left over after the feeding of the 5,000 and so on. In reality, the number of Jesus' disciples, students, followers, would fluctuate. And it was likely women were among them. We well know that the success of any movement doesn't depend on its spokespersons or leaders, but on the gifts and energy of the members. Jesus himself encouraged women. The two longest and most searching theological conversations Jesus had were with women. The Samaritan he met at the well and Martha, sister of Mary. And as the book of Acts unfolds, we meet several key women in different cities who nurtured this growing movement. Among them, Dorcas, Lydia, Damaris, 
Priscilla. I have to tell you that when I was working on this sermon, I checked these famous names and made a list. Then I remembered that I'd asked our reader to start the reading earlier, and I should speak to her before the service and make sure the congregation heard that so that they wondered where she was reading from, in case she, they wondered. So I wrote the readers down, name down on the nearest bit of paper, to remind me to discuss it with her this morning, which we did. When I got to the place in the sermon where I was going to quote these great New Testament women, I found it and I started to read down Dorcas, Miria, Damaris, Priscilla, Meg! <laughs> and why not? One of the magazines with last Sunday's papers featured one Haley Biber, Bieber, a model and a businesswoman with her own skincare brand, but better known as the wife of Justin Bieber, who, in case you didn't know, is one of the most famous pop stars on the planet. Yet, in spite of her 20 million pound Beverly Hills mansion and glamorous lifestyle, the quotation that was splashed across the cover drawing attention to the interview inside was this. Sometimes I just want to curl up and be a hermit. Now last Sunday, by coincidence, also happened to be the 650th of anniversary of a real hermit, or rather an anchoress. Anchoresses and anchorites were women and men who opted for a life set apart for prayer, but who chose not to enter a monastic community. She was Mother Julian of Norwich, whose words are still in print today, translated into many languages, the first book written by a woman in English. Five years ago, we visited the beautiful city of Norwich. In the part inside the medieval walls, there used to be 58 churches. It was a very prosperous city. There are still 31. Don't tell the presbytery. <laughs> Here, Julian lived with her cat, it is said, in a cell attached to the church whose only openings were a sight line to the altar and a window through which she could communicate with the wider world, a tiny space which she never left. There were many anchoresses and anchorites in that terrible time. The Black Death had decimated Europe from 1348 to 1351. And nearly half the citizens of Norwich died over these three terrible years. The devastation to the economy and the life of society can only be imagined. Julian was a child at that time, but it returned 15 years later. And it is thought that perhaps Julian grieved for the husband and family she had lost in the pandemic. But not only that, but the Hundred Years' War between England and France was raging. And there was the Peasants' Revolt, demonstrations across the nation for freedom from poverty and unjust taxes and the slavery of being serfs. Even the church felt like being on shifting sands at that point. There were two, and at one point three, separate popes, all claiming to be the real one. A bewildering and disillusioning time for pious Christians. And in the home church, there was danger and persecution following Wycliffe's translation of the Bible. A priest 
and an Oxford don who believed long before the Reformation that people should be able to read the Bible in their own language. We call this an anniversary, but it's not a date of birth we commemorate, nor of death, but most unusually, a vision. In 1374, Julian, very ill, had what we today would call a near-death experience. And at the crisis of her sickness, between four and nine in the afternoon, we're told, she receives 16, what she called, showings, revelations, visions. She reports that the heavens open to her and she beholds Christ in his glory and sees the meaning and power of his sufferings. She also sees Christ's mother, Mary. Julian recovers to live 33 years longer and in that time unpacked and explored the meaning of these revelations, praying and writing by herself in her cell, but always willing to give counsel to those who came to share their sorrows and dilemmas at her window. Julian is described as a mystic. But a mystic isn't someone who doesn't belong in the real world, but someone who has graduated to a deeper level of prayer. I'm sure many of us will recognize her most famous saying, all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. Some call her an optimist. But this is far from being a soothing placebo to make us feel better. There's no pie in the sky here. Julian was not an optimist, making the best of everything in spite of the evidence, but a realist. And this realism came from a life of deep prayer in which she felt she looked into the mind of God. It came from a, a fresh appreciation of who God was. She lived in a time of fear of hell, of an angry God and an angry church when people stepped over the mark. But her visions brought a different picture. And a picture that was not just a nice comforting vision, but a carefully argued and deep understanding of the nature of the Christian faith. It all comes back to the hazelnut. Julian saw God, not so much as creating the world, but loving the world into existence. <clears throat> And because, God, and because created in love, God continues to care for it passionately and consistently. At the very beginning of creation and of each human life was love. Through all the storms of life, messages of this love find their way through, although we may not always recognize it. And at the end, this great love welcomes us into God's presence. All will be well, said Julian, for all that is done is well done since our Lord God does all. As Isaiah says in our first reading, your builders outdo your destroyers. Those who rebuild you make better speed than those who pulled you down, while those who laid you waste leave you and go. The most characteristic element 
of Julian's mystical theology was rather daring. When she liked the divine love to motherly love, a theme found in the biblical prophets as also in our first reading, can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? According to Julian, God is both our mother and our father. And to those used to the stern, demanding kind of love of God as father, it was a revelation. G Julian saw this maternal side of God not as a metaphor, but as something she saw as literally true. God is not like a mother. God is literally the mother. She emphasized this by suggesting how the bond between mother and child is, as she saw it, the only earthly relationship that comes close to the relationship a person can have with Jesus. The effect of this long ago Christian woman on people today is vividly illustrated in two novels that have just been published, based on her life. One shows how her insights can guide and support people who are fighting debilitating disease or pain. Claire Gilbert speaks of her long journey of grueling cancer treatment and how Julian's insights helped her to cope, how she learned not to battle her illness nor to deny it, nor wish it wasn't there, but, but to walk towards it with lipstick and brightly coloured clothes. The second of these new novels shows a quite different effect of these visions of Julian on people today. Author Victoria Mackenzie confesses that she herself doesn't have a religious faith. She writes, but I think that Julian's theology is fascinating. I've always been interested in religion. I feel it is the bedrock for our ethical and legal systems now, so it's kind of crazy not to be interested. Thus, Julian speaks both to the Christian and the seeker. Perhaps our modern woman on the cover of the Sunday supplement was not so far wrong. Sometimes I just want to curl up and be a hermit. Our world is not so different from Julian's. Ecological crisis, a war that's drawing in the whole world, political conflict and the never-ending columns of refugees, slavery, power and the exploitation of the weak, Julian's message of the love of God comes down the centuries as we sang in our hymn, God made us, God loves us, and God will always care. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. This is a written for you on the order service. Do the stick forward. And there are one or two other ones that we should maybe add, um, include. And that is 
been touched on in the sermon by, by, by Douglas. This weekend, there's a G7 summit in Hiroshima where they're looking at the, um, the, the, the somewhat tenuous um, idea of peace amongst the, the, the nations, especially with Russia and Ukraine and the rising um, tension in China. We should pray for that summit with great heart heartiness. Also, this week, uh, this week is the week of um, mental health, uh, mental health awareness. So many people are suffering from tension and anxiety and uh, on, on drugs that perhaps they would normally need. It's a, it's a by byproduct, I think, of, of what's, what's been going on in the past with, with the, the, the pandemic. <coughs> but we should be aware of it and comfort people where we can. You're still looking for people for the choir, so we would like people who can sing. There's one or two other uh, announcements to draw attention to, so if I could add to what Alistair has said. Um, the, uh, the, the Glen Ross's partnership, uh, what do they call it, Thy Kingdom Come, that runs between now and Pentecost, comes to us on Thursday, and I believe that Harry, uh, Harry is giving the talk at 11.30 on Thursday morning in our hall for all the churches in the area. Um, I just want to say too that uh, this week we had a visit from the grass cutters. Uh, they sent a different team this time. They did a lovely job and they tidied up all the grass and the paths afterwards um, so that they, they, we, didn't, we didn't all walk it into the church. And so uh, we appreciate that. It also allows us to see more clearly the lovely display of uh, plants that uh, our church officers have uh, cared for uh, and planted and cared for in that context of our churchyard. Um, the minister is at the General Assembly. He will be away next Sunday as well and we will conduct the service. I think, I hope that's all of the uh, intimation. Oh yeah, except for uh, the one about the service next week, which is uh, a communion service. No, it's not. Oh, it's two weeks. It's the 4th of June, sorry. Oh, well, it's there. Uh, it's not next week. Don't panic. Right. Sorry. And the stated meeting after it. We continue now with our offering. Our offering from Douglas. <coughs> Almighty and ever-loving God, we give what we can with money. Help us to give our talents. Help us to give ourselves. 
Help us to give ourselves to your, your cause in this place and wherever we happen to be. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we pray for those whose dreams have been destroyed, those who no longer have the heart to look forward, who have lost their vision for the future. So many people known to us and unknown whose happiness and hopes have been dashed by tragedy, whose faith in loved ones have been betrayed, who face poverty and unemployment and homelessness, those who have to sleep in our town park at night because they have no home. We pray for those who suffer and who fight disease and starvation and even death <clears throat> whose trust in you has been tested sometimes beyond the limit God of hope light a new flame in their hearts we pray for those who plod wearily through life with no sense of purpose those who feel the future is empty, bereft of promise. Those who live only for today and those who are fearful of tomorrow. God of hope, light a new flame for them. <coughs> Touch their hearts, we pray. Stir their imagination. Rekindle their faith. Renew their hope. And so may new dreams and new visions be born in the most broken of lives. Living God, we pray for those who feel they have lost control, overwhelmed perhaps by tragedy, or relationships having, bro having broken down, battling against the rigors of old age, or wrestling with terminal illness, in pain of body or turmoil of mind. Assure them of your purpose and that it will always finally win through. We pray for the victims of other people's lack of control, those wounded in body or mind, abused children, battered wives, battered husbands, broken homes, <coughs> victims of rape or assault. Assure this, them all that your purpose will finally win through. We pray for those who struggle, those who struggle to control aspects of their character, their lust, temper, greed, impatience, envy, intolerance. Assure them that your purpose will always, in the end, win through. Father God, we pray for the people of Ukraine fighting against a powerful foe and yet maintaining their own, initi own identity and fighting to protect it. We pray for all those who have been damaged by that war, either through grief or injury. 
and we pray for the G7 summit in Hiroshima in Japan that it may find a way through to, to encourage peace in the world. We pray for the General Assembly as it meets in assembly this week. We pray for Connor, who has gone to, to, to represent us there, that they may find a way of looking at the church in the future. Assure them that your purpose will, in the end, always win through. Give to all the, those near the end of their tether the assurance that you are ultimately there with them, with those who hurt, the comfort of your healing love, to those troubled in mind, the inner peace which you alone can give, to those dismayed by the repeated failings, the gift of self-control. Lord of all, assure them and us that your purpose shall finally win through. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. become used to a short time of quietness and reflection at the end of a service, I suggest in this time before we leave, we think about two questions. For Julian, the love of God has for us is like the love of a mother. Since we have been used so long to a sterner God, do we find it difficult do we find it a challenge to think of God's love as that of a mother? And a second question, if we could take on board this idea, would it make a difference to how we understand the love of God in our lives? We keep silent.
peace and in very great joy to love and to serve him and one another. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each one of you now and forevermore.